Welcome to Pet Patrol, Protector of the Pack. I'm Alan Brassel, your host. And today I have the privilege of having with me Dr. John Lewis from North Star and Phil Barnes, Director of Marketing from North Star. It's actually Phil's second trip back, so we, he did really good last time. We let him back in the door. Uh, this is going to be interesting because I think the topic that we're going to be discussing with Dr. Lewis is something that most of us know very little about, make very bad assumptions, and then question every time our veterinarian tells us something because it's in the area of dentistry. Uh, I guess the first question I always ask this is, what made you decide after becoming a veterinarian to go into the dentistry area? Good question. I, I did not have uh, a thought that I would become a specialist in dentistry when I graduated from veterinary school. In fact, I went out into general practice because when I was in veterinary school, every rotation I went through, I could see myself doing that specific specialty for the rest of my life. So I decided to just go out to general practice, kind of see what uh, interested me the most after I had some more time out in general practice. And um, I found that because I, w I hired on with a five doctor practice down outside of Raleigh, North Carolina, I found that um, I was a, one of the newer graduates there and I had a little bit more dental training during my schooling than some of the doctors that had been out for a while. So I was getting a lot of internal referrals from those other doctors in the practice, so I kind of learned about dentistry out of necessity because I was getting a lot of internal referrals. And then um, at the same time, I was undergoing some dental work myself because when I was younger, I was a baseball player, and I happened to have a uh, grounder that popped up and hit me in the teeth. And at that point, I had some root canals that lasted until uh, probably I was about 26, 27 years old. Right after I graduated from veterinary school, they started to... Uh, to get um, infected and I had to get some extractions and some implants placed. So I was spending many days off at the human dentist and got interested in it that way. That, 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 that's amazing. You, you, you think about what drives us to where we're at. So you actually, having gone through a lot of what the animals go through, you have a passion or compassion for them and an understanding of what and I can see where I, I feel your pain sort of thing. Absolutely, yeah. I, I can remember, you know, sitting in the dental chair myself for an hour and a half, sometimes two hours with some of this work that had to be done. And and uh, that, that makes me think about think twice about how I position my patients, how I do my procedures. And so a lot of personal experience, I think, goes a long way. Now, what I find interesting about what you do, and, and for those of you who are not familiar with North Star, North Star is the, in my mind, in the Delaware Valley, the premier emergency veterinarian uh, practice and specialty. When uh, my family vet, which is now Lisa R. Miller at House Paws, Lisa many times will send us to you folks when she said, I want a better opinion, so, because each individual there has their specialty. As to dentistry, I've gone for my dogs have gone for cleanings. I don't say I go for cleanings, but probably it would be just as easy. Uh, my dogs go for cleanings there. What do you do that's different from what they would do? They usually don't take it past the cleaning or maybe an extraction or two. Right, yeah. So I, th I, I envision the, um, the general practitioner, you know, uh, when I was in general practice, uh, and, and the general practitioners that refer to me, I envision those as sort of the conductor of an orchestra. And, and so they're kind of the first line of kind of taking a look in the mouth, determining when a cleaning needs to be done, determining when there's something more than a cleaning needs to be done. So my caseload is very different from a general practitioner's in that uh, I don't typically do routine cleanings if there's really anything such as a routine cleaning, you know. But I think that um, uh, a lot of anesthetic risk patients that, that uh, primary care vets see the patient, they know that there's some pain in the mouth that's affecting that animal's quality of life, they know that that patient needs to be put under anesthesia, but they know that there's an increased risk associated with that. So we see a lot of high risk anesthetic patients that need a lot of extractions and oral surgery. We see a lot of patients that uh, have oral tumors, uh, and we see patients that have jaw fractures. Um, so not just dentistry, but oral and maxillofacial surgery is what we do as veterinary dentists. Now, you go through education-wise. Give the folks an idea, this, this is not quick, of <laughs> what you have to go through and the years that it takes to get to where you are today. Yeah, very similar to um, you know a human oral and maxillofacial surgeon, uh, but uh, its first step is undergrad and then veterinary school. 
and then uh, either an internship or an equivalent out in private practice before going back to do a residency. And virtually all the residencies in dentistry and oral surgery these days are a three-year residency that requires going back to academia to uh, not only be able to learn how to do these procedures, but also learn how to interpret studies and do studies and be able to submit publications and that type of stuff. So um, a lot of additional training beyond the uh, veterinary school. And that's one thing when I was a professor in veterinary school, I um, realized that we don't give our veterinary students nearly as much training in dentistry as we would like to. And I understand why, just because there's so many different things that they need to learn about from those four years. But um, but dentistry being a relatively new specialty, something with we really didn't pay much attention to 30 years ago, it's still trying to get its foot in the door in the veterinary educational process. And so, um, so when I graduated from veterinary school, I did not feel that comfortable with doing a lot of these dental procedures, so I had to seek out more and more continuing education opportunities as well as eventually going back to do the residency to be able to feel comfortable doing some of this stuff. I, I find that, and again, I've had pets, cats, dogs, we've had snakes, we've had alligators, we've had the whole gamut over the years. People don't seem to understand why dental work on starting with a cleaning why it's important. Can you give the folks an idea of, okay, you, take, you, you see a little tartar on your dog's teeth, your cat's teeth, here's why, this is what, this is where we go from here and here are the things that can happen if you don't take care of it. Yeah, um, just like the myriad of studies that are available on the human side that are suggesting maintenance of a healthy mouth helps to maintain a healthy body, there's more and more studies coming out on the veterinary side that, that suggest that as well. Um, one of the most impressive studies that I've seen was one that was done by my resident mate when I was at Penn, Dr. Uh, Jennifer Rawlinson. She did a study where she looked at an inflammatory mediator in the bloodstream called C-reactive protein. And she looked at C-reactive protein prior to dental treatment and 28 days after dental treatment in the same set of patients, so they kind of acted as their own control. And she found that there was uh, the, the degree of reduction in C-reactive protein was related to the degree of periodontal disease in their mouth. So after appropriate dental treatment, the, the measures of systemic inflammation actually went down in the body, and that's something that, um, you know, you can imagine how chronic inflammation can play a role in a lot of these other diseases that occur in our, our veterinary patients, such as perhaps chronic valvular disease of the heart, um, issues with liver and kidney disease and, and so um, it's something that we're always looking for more and, and more cause and effect relationships between dental disease and other diseases in the body but there is a good body of information out there right now that suggests that there is a link there between maintaining a healthy mouth and maintaining a healthy body. So actually no different than for you and I. Yeah. If we don't take care of our mouths the diseases can flow. We're going to take a quick break a uh, quick commercial break, uh, and then we will come back uh, with Dr. Lewis and with Phil. And again, this is Pet Patrol, Protector of the Pack. Alan Braswell, your host. See you in a couple. Welcome back to Pet Patrol. Protector of the Pack. This is Alan Brassel, your host, and again today I have with me Dr. John Lewis from North Star Vets and Phil Barnes, North Star Vets, Director of Marketing. Uh, we were talking a little bit during the break about things you, patients you remember. Uh, I know my own dentist will tell me he's got a few he remembers. Yes. <laughs> I'm not so I'm not so sure whether Fred had what some of Fred's reasons are at times. <laughs> good to be but some of some of the some of the patients that you remember. Yeah, I mean, this could take hours to talk about, <laughs> but I think that uh, um, there's a lot of memorable patients for a variety of reasons. I'm coming up on 20 years out of veterinary school now, so I've got a lot of good stories, but um, I guess I'd start with uh, probably one of my most famous patients. Uh, when I was at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, a French bulldog came to see me named Lentil. Lentil had a bilateral cleft lip and a cleft palate. And um, so he came to us at a time when, um, about four months prior, 
I had done a lecture at the medical school uh, to some of the plastic surgeons and um, uh, oral and maxillofacial surgeons who do some of the cleft palate repairs uh, in, uh, in the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And, and uh, when I gave this lecture to this group, I talked about how neat it would be to get some of our veterinary patients and some of the, the children who have had similar surgeries together in one room um, to support each other and see that they undergo the same types of things. And, um, and so shortly after that, Lentil came in through our door and, and he seemed to be the perfect ambassador for this program. And so uh, ever since then, shortly after uh, Lentil came to see us and we repaired his cleft palate, Dr. Alex Ryder and I were the surgeons on the case at, at Penn, and, and uh, when, um, when we repaired his soft palate and hard palate, we didn't repair his lip because that was more of a cosmetic issue, and he looked pretty darn cute even with the bilateral cleft lips. So, um, so he still has a, you know, a craniofacial difference when you look at him from outside, um, but, um, but he has been a great ambassador for this program that we do every year called the Best Friends Bash, which we get uh, children, uh, and the patients from the Children's Hospital and some of our veterinary patients who have had similar craniofacial surgeries in the same room. And it's just magical to see how uh, getting them together and, and spending some time together and us being able to spend time together as clinicians of dogs and cats and clinicians uh, who work on people and make trading ideas and, and uh, the exchange of, of uh, different techniques and discussions of patient care is just a, a really magical thing that I look forward to every year. That has to be a great experience for the kids because we, we know how how good dogs are. One of my dogs is a therapy dog, and and how they work with people and how how they bring their blood pressure down and they make them feel better. But for a child to see a puppy or 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 an adult dog, whatever, that has the same thing as them and how they're relating to it. Yep. So I guess some of them see it before the surgery, some after the surgery, and yep, yep. Is, and some of these kids that. Um, are at the Children's Hospital have to have you know 30 or more surgeries throughout their life to repair some of these craniofacial wow. defects that they have. So it's nice for them to be able to take a break and wherever they are in their level of treatment, um, they get to see that you know some dogs go through the same thing. And, and I thought when I first started to put this program together, I thought that it was going to be that the children were going to be so impressed and uh, and kind of um, enamored by the fact that dogs just don't. Um, don't have a lot of that, uh, you know, those problems with dealing with all the things that they have to deal with with their disease and their post-operative period. But kids are the same way. They're just so resilient. It's just so inspiring to, to see them interact together. That is amazing. Now, I know you mentioned, uh, we were laughing about another one of your patients, Jaws, not Jaworski, <laughs> different Jaws. That can, what can you tell us about Jaws? Because this was fascinating. Yeah, Jaws was a relatively recent patient that we saw. Um, he was unique in the fact that he was a uh, case that uh, was a cat that had sustained some type of trauma, probably got hit by a car, but we will never know what type of trauma he really had sustained. But uh, a good Samaritan found him under their car and heard him meowing. And it took them a while to actually get him to come out from underneath the car. But they took him to their primary care vet, who stabilized him. Um, got him ready to be sent to North Star, and then they sent him to North Star for us to assess his jaw fractures, and that's where he got his name, because of all his jaw fractures. And he uh, had upper jaw fractures, lower jaw fractures, split of the two lower jaws down the middle, and he just looked very different than how he should have looked and, and, uh, and wasn't able to function because of all these jaw fractures. So um, a couple of surgeries, and he's gotten back to his normal self, and it was just inspiring to see how these owners who didn't even know this cat, uh, these new owners who didn't even know this cat, um, took them under uh, their wing and just uh, without hesitation, once they heard from me that, that it wouldn't be inhumane to consider treatment, um, they were all in. So it was really, really neat in that regard. Now, you had one other we talked about which fascinated me. I thought it was a James Bond movie, uh, <laughs> Nero. Yes, uh, Nero uh, has since passed away recently, but he was a, uh, a, a police dog for uh, Mercer County Police Department. And uh, Pat Papero was the officer who uh, worked with Nero. And, and Pat uh, brought Nero to see me uh, because of the fact that Nero had a fractured tooth. And this fractured tooth had gone underneath the gum line quite a bit. And police dogs use their fangs like policemen use 
their guns. And, and so it's something that they really have to have um, available to them. So a loss of a fang means stress put on the other three fangs in different ways, and, and so it can be kind of a vicious cycle. Um, so we wanted to try and save this right upper canine tooth if possible. So we had to do some periodontal surgery where we lifted up the gums, removed some bone around the root to act, allow the root to act as a crown, uh, and then we did a crown preparation and a root canal, and eventually got a metal crown placed on the crown so that he could go back to doing bite work. And he went on for many years after that to do, do good things for the, for the department. And, and similarly, I had a, a recent uh, patient that came in, his name was Legend, and he had a um, uh, history of when he did bite work, they bite on a bite sleeve, and he was, instead of grabbing on and holding on like they're trained to do, he was grabbing and letting go, grabbing and letting go. And so, sure enough, he had a fractured canine tooth, and uh, once we did a root canal on that tooth, removed the sensitivity from that tooth, and placed a crown on there, uh, he's back to his normal working, so that's been great. That had to be a scary sight if you were, if that dog was coming at, if Nero was coming at you with, his, <laughs> with that metal canine. Yes, yes. I, I would say the police officers don't seem to mind the uh, extra bling that the crown provides, but, but that's not the you know, main it. reason, of course, but it does provide some protection to a, uh, a tooth that we put a lot of work into. And, and I'm sure the dog appreciated it, too, because they, they don't, while they don't complain, there's still the pain there. Right, yeah. We have some more questions for you. We're going to take another quick commercial break. Again, this is Pet Patrol Protector of the Pack. Alan Braswell, your host. Dr. John, Dr. Lewis, Phil, we'll be back in a few moments. Back to Pet Patrol, Protector of the Pack. This is Alan Brassel, your host. And again, I'm here with Dr. John Lewis and Phil Barnes, Director of Marketing, both from North Star Vets. Uh, we've been ignoring Phil for this entire conversation. That is not Phil on the table. Uh, that's actually a real dog skull, and we have some interesting things to talk about um, and share with you in that area. But, Phil, I haven't seen you folks in about two months. That was my last visit with one of my dogs. Right. What's new? Uh, how's the blood drive? Had the blood drive go? Yeah. Do you still need blood donations, and how can people do that? What's new over at North Star as so, well? Yeah, we had two very successful blood drives back in June, and uh, one was in the Robbinsville location, one was in the Maple Shade location, and uh, a lot of people came out. A lot of pets came out. Um, I know the Red Cross um, blew through their their goal for the day, so we had a lot of people come out. Um, we got a lot of greyhounds that came out. Uh, to, to donate blood, and, and we love the greyhounds because they're the universal blood donors for, for dogs. I didn't know that. Yeah, and so um, it was. they were great days, so we were very happy. And since then, we've had some other people sign on. The need for blood is constant, it's year-round, so we're always looking for donors. So anybody who has a pet at home uh, that would like to consider being a part of the canine and feline blood bank at North Star Vets can go to northstarvets.com slash bank and they can get all the information there, the requirements are there, um, and also there's an online survey they can take as a pre-screen uh, to see if their dog or cat would be eligible. So we definitely can do that. And it's certain sizes, it can't be under a certain weight if I remember correctly. That's right, yeah, we're looking for cats over uh, 10 pounds, I think, and dogs uh, over 50 pounds. Uh, so they can get you know, a, the amount of blood out of them and it doesn't take too much blood out of the pet. <laughs> And, and I remember the last time you folks were out that there's also a big advantage for the owner of the pet because of the blood work that you do. Yeah, yeah, when the pet's prior, in, um, we do an exam on the pet. Uh, we take a little bit of blood and we test the blood to make sure that the pet is fit for donating. And uh, so a side benefit of that is that the, the pet gets a, you know, a good exam by a veterinarian. Um, they get the free blood panel. And then uh, any blood that they donate, um, if that pet needs blood in the future, they can get that much blood back. So, um, so there are, are definitely some benefits to pet owners that uh, they should consider you know, looking into. And all that information is there on, on the North Star Vets website. Now, what what is new that we don't know about? That's yes, happened? so uh, North Star Vets is, uh, we're very happy. We were named a level one veterinary trauma center. Uh, and so this is a special recognition uh, at the, the level of emergency care that we can offer uh, to pets. And um, there are only a handful of facilities across the U.S. that have this designation, and uh, we're the only one between New York and Delaware that uh, is a level one veterinary trauma center. So 
Um, we're very happy to have uh, been accredited with that, and uh, it's just one more um, thing that uh, puts North Star Vets in a good position to uh, to treat dogs and cats and pets in emergencies. That is right. That's good news. Uh, Dr. Lewis, tell us about the head. <laughs> Actually, the jaw part especially. <laughs> All right, so I brought a little prop here. This is a, uh, a dog skull, and uh, this is about the size of a skull of a, uh, a pit bull dog. And uh, some of the things you'll notice is they have a lower jaw and an upper jaw, and this is the cheekbone of the dog. And uh, the upper jaw and the lower jaw meet together back here in the back where they have a TMJ joint, just like people do, a temporal mandibular joint. So we see animals with dental issues, but we see them present with uncomfortable chewing and, and pain associated with TMJ, just like people get. Uh, we can even see issues with, uh, with certain breeds where they have, um, you've probably heard of hip dysplasia. They can get TMJ dysplasia as well, and that can cause okay. some arthritis, can cause some issues with um, the jaw locking in an abnormal way where the uh, lower jaw gets caught on the upper jaw. So there's a lot of things that we get that our dogs and cats get as well. One of the things I uh, brought this skull for today was to uh, talk about brushing. Brushing is something that if you ask me if I brush my own pet's teeth, I do not, but I would like to. Uh, I don't get around to it as often as I should, but that means that I'm going to need to have to do more frequent cleaning. So if you want to get as much mileage out of a cleaning as possible, daily brushing is by far the best option to do that. And some of the tips that we've learned through the years in terms of what allows for a, a good brushing experience is the thing that dogs and cats dislike the most is when you open their mouth. So if you can get to as many tooth surfaces without opening the mouth, then they will much better tolerate it. Okay. Okay. So um, I like to use something that has bristles unlike, uh, rather than something like a finger brush that has those little rubber knobs on it because the bristles are going to act like a broom to just sweep underneath the gum line. And the gum line is the area that you really want to focus on because of the fact that that's where the communication between the mouth uh, and, and the teeth and the rest of the body is occurring and that's where the attachment structures of the teeth are. So a back and forth motion or a circular motion with the bristles pointed upwards on the upper jaw or downwards on the lower jaw to get into that what's called the gingival sulcus or that little groove in between the gums and the tooth. And you can get to pretty much every surface on the outside of the teeth without opening the mouth. So save the opening of the mouth for last. Now, I've never seen a toothbrush like that in any of the pet stores or whatever. Now, do you folks have those? Can people buy them from you? Yeah. Because that would make the length of it, especially, and the double brushes would make yeah. it a lot, a lot easier. Yeah, this is a veterinary type toothbrush that's made by one of the companies that uh, is, has a lot of different veterinary dental products. Um, and it's nice soft bristle. That's another important thing. If you want it to be well tolerated, it has to be soft bristle rather than a harder bristle. And I even soften a little bit more by running it under a little bit of warm water. And the other thing that I think is helpful to know is that sometimes they like the taste of the doggy toothpaste a little bit too much and so they'll chew on the brush instead of letting you get the brush where you want it to be. So sometimes just a little bit of warm water will be a better option than actually putting paste on the brush, at least for starters. I was just going to ask you that. Is the, it's just a matter of doing the brushing. You may not, you, right. don't, you don't necessarily need to use yeah, the mechanical effect things. of the bristles is going to be more important than anything you put on the brush. So, um, so uh, you can put just warm water on it. Uh, if we have a patient that has established periodontal disease, there might be some type of antibacterial solution we might have you put on the brush. But, um, but for the most part, it's the mechanical effect of the bristles. We want to get that plaque swept off the tooth before it mineralizes and turns into tartar because once it's tartar, it's not going to brush off. What about some of these sprays that get advertised? I mean. The old adage, I saw it on the internet, it must be true. <laughs> uh, not really. Right. Uh, what are, you, are there any out there that are actually of any value that, that help with the tartar? Yeah, I think there are some, uh, but you have to look at the ingredients that are in them. Like A lot of these products, um, they're upwards of 50 proof uh, ethyl alcohol in them. So um, you don't realize until you look at the, the ingredients on the back, but that might have an effect on dissolving plaque, but it might be <laughs> something that you don't necessarily want your dog to get hooked on. <laughs> but, um, but I think that, um, that 
it's important to take a look at the ingredients, maybe run it by your primary care vet or, or if you're having a relationship with a veterinary dentist, to have them take a look at the ingredients on any specific product that you decide to try. What about um, brushing a dog's tongue? Because I know that my dentist says you brush your own tongue as well. Do you, do you right. Yeah, that will certainly help to decrease the doggy breath to some degree because there's so many little nooks and crannies on the tongue that that contributes to the halitosis that we sometimes, you know, will, will smell. Even if the teeth look wonderful, um, the surface of the tongue can be a source for bacteria to uh, hide in those nooks and crannies on the rough surface of the tongue. But that, that dog breath can also be due to pockets around the tooth. So sometimes especially when you're doing a good job of cleaning the crowns but not really cleaning underneath the gum line, you can get some pockets that form underneath the gums. And there's normally a little bit of a normal pocket depth called the gingival sulcus, which is usually about one to three millimeters. But it's when we get those pockets that are four, five, six, ten millimeters deep, the food and bacteria just get lodged up in there, and that's where you get that really bad dog breath. The other question I had for you is, is in things that dogs chew. I mean, I was told by Ed Sleeper, Years, well, our vet years for you many years. Yeah. Don't ever give your dog rawhide. He said I do more. He said unless you want to make me wealthy, I do more <laughs> surgery because of rawhide than anything else. Uh, and he got us into using bully sticks, and uh, because he thought that they were digestible. Do, are th will they help with cleaning the dog's teeth, or are there, are there other yeah. things? I mean, I've seen the greenies, and then the whole thing came out on greenies that you're going to kill your dog because they, when they digest them, what's what are good chews right. for a dog? I'm glad you brought this up because there's a certain number of uh, items that I see causing the most tooth fractures in dogs, and dogs can generate a huge amount of force with their jaws when they close their jaws, so it's not hard for them to fracture a tooth, especially these back teeth where these upper, what are called carnassial teeth are, and carnassial is a term that interpreted literally means tearing of flesh, so when they were out hunting for themselves, that's what they used to tear the flesh off of the bone, but um, those carnassial teeth are um, at a risk of fracturing when they chew on things like real bones, nylon bones, cow hooves, deer antlers. I've seen a spike in tooth fractures with deer antlers. Really? So I would uh, steer clear I'm of guilty. all those things. I'm guilty on deer antlers that are split. <laughs> they love to chew out the marrow. Yeah, they love them, but uh, I've seen a lot of tooth fractures oh, since they've become popular. So <laughs> what can you let your pet chew on? Well, I think that Supervised raw hide chewing is okay, but you know they get soft and they chew off a big chunk of it, and then it just sits in the stomach. So you have to be careful with raw hides. Um, I think that bully sticks generally have enough give that they're not going to cause a tooth fracture. I've seen maybe an exceptional case where a dog was only chewing on bully sticks and may have had a fracture here or there, but that's the exception rather than the rule. Um, and I think that anything that has a little give to it. There's a veterinary dentist up in Canada. His name is Fraser Hale, and he says. If you wouldn't want to be hit in the knee with it, then it's probably too <laughs> hard to give to your pet. I love Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of brings it all home. Yeah. 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 I use that all the time. <laughs> that, that is interesting. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple minutes left, so we come back to Phil. We give Phil yeah, a chance. Sure, sure. Phil, tell people how they can reach out. Tell them the specialties that you folks have. Uh, Reach out to the, we got you on uh, one of the cameras, so we'll look directly at the camera. How they can contact you, what are the specialties that you folks do, because you do so many wonderful things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you, so know, you know the routine. I want yeah. them to be able to come to you and not, like I say, the other guys who I don't really like to go to. Sure. Well, uh, North Star Vets has two locations now. Uh, our main location is in Robbinsville, New Jersey, and we've just opened a satellite clinic in Maple Shade, New Jersey. Uh, you can get either location with the same phone number, so we're reachable at 609-259-8300. You can get all the information you need <coughs> from us at northstarvets.com. And I definitely encourage people to check out our uh, blog on the website and our newsroom and even our page on Facebook because there's so many great stories, like some of the ones that you heard here today, uh, that we share there. And you can get to know our doctors a little bit better and the kind of things that they do and are doing. Um, and so when you say, by the way, satellite, I have been, met, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, many times to the Mount, the Maple Shade uh, location. It's uh, right by Lowe's off of uh, 73 and 38. Yep. If that's a satellite, it's one of the nicest satellite locations <laughs> I have seen yeah, in a long time. Building, there, yeah. is, there isn't anything I think you can't do there. 
yeah, well, yeah. Within, within reason, I mean, yeah. it, it is an amazing facility and an amazing group of people. Yeah, it's um, it's a it's a great location, and the same doctors that we have working in Robbinsville rotate through there. So if you do come to see one of our specialists in Robbinsville, but you live in South Jersey, um, you can if you have follow up appointments or recurring appointments with them, um, that's what that initial location is all about, because uh, you can continue to see that same doctor, the same continuing of care. Uh, but at a more c geographically convenient location. And one simple phone number I found, which I really like, you yep. know, one number, yeah, you yeah, get so through, well. the, yep. the, you're, you're, the administrative part of a business can either make you or break you. And, and the people that you'll talk to on the phones at Northstar, are, they understand, they hear what you have to say, they, under, they, they, want, they take care of you where you need to be. It's, it's a very easy process. Yeah, yeah it's a yeah. great group of people. And, uh, you know, no attitudes, yeah. you know, I mean, it's just really a good group. Yeah, yeah. And of course, it's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so if you have a veterinary emergency, uh, we're always there for you. Phil, John, I, I really appreciate you coming in. Uh, we're gonna, I love running the North Star folks through here because more people to need to know about what you do and how you supplement what their family veterinarian might be able to do. Uh, as I've said, and I'll say it again and again, we have used North Star many, many times, and I have never been unhappy, never disappointed, and they have always done right by my animals. So thank you very much. Nice to meet you. We, uh, this is Pet Patrol, protector of the pack. We will see you again uh, real soon.